Hey everybody, Tom Joya from Visionary Music Group here. Today we're doing a video featuring our mix template. After we did three different songs, Anatomy of the Mixes, and we broke them down, and on the last one we did the mix from scratch, then folks saw the template at work and how I moved things around and imported it. So let's review all that and let's just explain what my template is. So here we go. I have some memory markers over here and I use them for track visibility. So let's utilize those right now. So you're seeing everything and it all comes in and active. So it loads very quickly because there's a lot of processing available for us when we need it. And I use these markers just to show what I need as I need it. So right now we're just seeing two things, <clears throat> my mix auxiliary and my mix print track. The mix print track is an audio track that's receiving signal from the output of the mix auxiliary track. The mix auxiliary track is an aux setup so I can put two bus processing on here. So I have my quad comp, my Greg Wells, my massive passive. If I need it, I have a mid-side pro Q. I have a dangerous liaison which routes a bunch of analog outboard which I covered in another video. We'll get more in depth in that. And then I have this Brainworks V2. In case I have to do mid sign EQing, but mainly for the stereo widener, which I automate. Fab Filter Pro L. And then the adapter AB so I can reference and look at my meters. So my routing is two Aurora 16s, 32 outputs. That goes into two dangerous two bus LTs 32 channels of analog summing mixing. That returns to my Burl B2 Bomber, which is a analog to digital converter. So the, the stereo outs of the summing mixer go into the converter, the Burl, and then the Burl feeds back digitally into the mix Auroras, which we have right here, the Burl input of my mix aux, and then that prints to my mix print track. So I have it in the session so I could punch in and out anytime. Let's go to the next marker point. You didn't see this in any of the videos, but at some point we'll show this. Mix flanger. What this is, is FL means flanger in my shortcut, shorthand speak. Uh, I just, when the mix track is printed, I just drag it over down to the flange track. And then I use an even tied uh, time adjuster and I automate it and sweep it. So it gives me the simulation of flanging two tape machines. The flanging plugins on the mix just never seem to do it for me. VCAs. Let's make these active and we could take a look. Okay, so I have a VCA for every particular group of instrument. So all the drums are controlled by a single VCA submaster. All the basses by a single VCA submaster. Percussion and loops, electric guitars, acoustics, keys, and so on. The video before last, I kind of went into depth with these. So you might want to check that out. What's cool about this is if you want to do stem mixing for someone, you can just mute the particular instruments and leave open the ones you want to record for your, for your stems. What I use it for a lot is in Anatomy of a Mix 3, in the final video I explained it and showed what I did, is I'll, I'll use it to make global rides of sections. So if I want the verse to be a little lower, if I feel like let's say in one part of the song, the vocal's too high level-wise and the instruments are a little low, I can just grab them really fast. A lot of times I'll take the whole song down 2 dB and ramp up the volume section by section so the song grows. Sometimes I'll take down beats of choruses and hit them with a little, like a dB or half a dB to give it some emphasis. So I could do it all here at my VCAs. Uh, after my VCAs, I have these things that say SC. They are my sidechain. So my sidechain processing is parallel compression and EQ that I can dial in and out of a song as needed. So I have a sidechain processor for all the drums and bass. I have one sidechain B for all my instruments on the sides like keyboards and pads and sustaining things. I have uh, one called uh, sidechain C, which is just to give me a little mid-range bite. I have a tape emulator 
which I like to feed everything into a little bit at varying degrees and slide this in and out as needed. And, and these are mainly things that I've liked on whole mixes, but I felt like they weren't enough to put on the two bus, but the certain instruments sounded great in that aspect. Then I have one to, to crush the snare and the kick together and emphasize those. I have one to glue the bass and the kick together. I have two options. I have one for the drums, for the shells, which would be the, you know, the non cymbals and not the rooms. And that's a distressor plug in. I have side chains for the bass, uh, the different ones, Billy Decker. I have uh, side chains for the guitar and another, uh, like I have one that's an LA3A that I use and with a pull tech. And the other one is a, is a Billy Decker plug in with a pull tech. So they all have different flavors and they may get used, they may not get used, but they're always there readily available. Now we'll slide down. I have side chains for vocals. Now these are the same, but the options with these are they give me a tonal palette for, let's say, a lead vocal. So for instance, I have one, two, three, three different ones for the lead vocals. So what they allow me to do is the 1176 has a great mid-range bark to it. This slate one, I made a little rack to, of um, different things, and that gives me the kind of the attack of a distressor, but I have a little bit of this almost like a API kind of brightness. Then, then I have this, uh, oops, that's a gate because this one gets noisy. Abbey Road, this is good for like saturation. And if I don't want to saturate right on the vocal, now a lot of folks say, why don't you just put a saturation plug in on the vocal dial and mix down? Well, I may have a lot of vocals or I may have a lead vocal and I may have a double, triple quads and I don't want to put one on each channel. It's, it's redundant, it, it burns processing and it's too much to manage. So they're on sense and I can blend them. Same thing with the backgrounds. I use the Billy Decker Vox as one of my parallels and I also use this Fairchild. So then below the side chains, I have all of my auxiliary channels. I'm gonna open those up for you so you can see them. So all, why do I have aux submasters? So I have aux submasters for different reasons. The main thing is to manage my session, I set my aux submasters at zero. And if I see that they're zero, I know there's no automation on it. It's foolproof. What I do is I leave these at zero and they're fed from the audio tracks. So why this is cool is if you check this out, I'll make them bigger. So here's a kick in bus, snare in bus. So for instance, kicks, I'll have a kick in mic, out mic, uh, sample one, two, three, maybe ambient kick samples. So, so they can all be funneled down to one place. Now they can be processed with this insert is an 1176. I set it one way. I never touch it. This one is for one side of my pull tech. Same thing. I set it one way. I never touch it. Another one is a tone Lux EQ. I set it and I don't touch it. Then I have all these other options available in active. So why do I have these here set up so I don't have to touch them? Well, first of all, most of these boxes have a sweet spot. So I try to find it for that instrument and leave it. Number two, people want to keep coming back to songs and revise them. I have indie clients that it takes them a long time to finish records because they're self-financing. So they'll come in with a little bit every couple of weeks. So you want to be able to open songs and go back and help them get to where they were. So if the analog gear stays the same and it doesn't change, all you have to do is run some tones through and calibrate it every so often and you know you're cool. Second question people ask me about this is why don't you just use plugins? Well, I've tried it and I can do it, but I have to use more plugins. It's more variable and it takes me longer. I feel like having the plugins that I need on the audio tracks and funneling up to the auxes and putting the analog gear on the auxes is kind of like the difference between 4K TV and like early, like high definition TV. It, it blows it up, it makes it bigger. And that's kind of our job, right? Okay, so as we move down, now I have uh, different ones for different purposes on the toms. I do like this pull tech and I only have two channels, so that works. Sound Toys uh, SIEQ is great for high end. And then I have um, this SPL. So some of the things are awesome that are plugins and I want to mix and match. I also have the, the Tone Lux EQs. I have a kick, a snare, 
two for the rooms and two for the toms of my tone lux EQs. And then I have two API 550Bs that I dedicate to one of my guitar auxes. Now, I also have here, I have um, all these inactive things. So I'm set up if I have stomps, if I have claps, if I have loops, if I have hits. Sometimes I do cinematic like sub hits. A clap helper is like a mult for the clap. They're all ready to go and I have to activate any of these plugins if I need them. Sometimes I get it right, right at the channel. And on, in this column, in my sends, all my side chain sends in the first row, A through E, and my F through J sends could be room sounds or whatever. And my final one is the tape send, if needed. So what's interesting about this, to make my life easy, I just hit this, these faders, and I can get any combinations I want. So, uh, no, I'm sorry. I hit these markers over here and I can get any combination I like. So what I just did then was this is drum aux and sidechain. Audio, I mean, and sidechain. So I have my, my side chains for the drums and the drum audio. Let's go back to full view. So after I get through all of these aux masters, so I have them for pretty much everything you can imagine. So I have aux masters for every group of instruments possible. I have them for electric pianos, acoustic pianos, B3, synths, pads, and they're all going to their appropriate outputs. Now that's another thing to consider. Another reason why the aux submasters are important, they're fed directly to the outputs that I want them to be in my summing mixer. So my kicks, my snares, my bass, and my lead vocals are always in mono. So I have channels set up in mono, my first four of the submixer. Then the remaining channels, 12 on the first one and 16 on the second one, are stereo. And each one of these aux subs are assigned to those. So if we, let's go look at uh, one we didn't see, like a, uh, okay, P let's look at the keyboards real quick. And we can check their outputs. So now you see I had to flip through the session. So what's really easy to do is to go to your view and I'm right at the keyboards, which is pretty darn awesome. So you'll see here, these are the outputs, keyboard out, K, K1 out, K2, etc. So I'm set, everything's ready to go whenever I need it to be. Now, the only kind of work I really have to do is, in the session is, is import everything. So what my process is, if it's a song that either I produce or the client says just start from scratch, I'll blow out their IO settings, clear everything out after it's cleaned and, and, and ready to go to be mixed. And then I'll make a new session, just call it whatever the name of the tune is in the mix session. Then I'll import all of this stuff and import all of the IO with it. It'll be down at the bottom of the session. Then what I would do is, I don't have to fish so much through all this stuff. All that I really do to make it easy is my audio tracks are from here down to there. So I make them active. And then what I do is I take the audio tracks from the tune and I copy them over to these. And that literally importing it and copying them over takes about, I don't know, less than 10 minutes. So once these are activated and everything's copied over, what's really great is all I have to do is take a quick listen. So, so my process would be, I'll show you once they finish activating. So my, here's all the audio, right? So my process would be, for instance, if I had drums, let's say, we'll start with those. I would drag the kick to here and then that kick will trigger my samples. So I just duplicate that and drag that to all those. Same thing with the snare, drag it, it's ready to go. Next step for me, I have, I have this auto align plugin. I would phase align all the drums. Takes a little bit, not very long. Next step, Pro Q2, Fab Filter. I would go in and I would probably dip some frequency. So I have one band set up and I have the highs and lows. I can roll them off. And then I would go to one of my favorites, the Brainworks uh, Channel Strip, SSL 4000. Then I would EQ it just like a console. Now there's my kind of final important point about this part of the template. 
In the old days, you went to a studio, they had a mixing board. The mixing board had input levels. It had sometimes compression. If not, it had insert points for compression. It had a gate or an insert point for a gate. It definitely had an EQ in it, and it had a fader, and it had auxiliary sends. So this is already set up and ready to go. If you look in here, if you go to my buses, there's all my group sends, there's all my side chains, there's all my auxiliary sends, and then there are the outputs. So when folks are at home mixing and they start every mix from scratch, it's like they're building their whole recording studio, doing all their wiring, wiring up their patch bay every single time. I don't know about you, but I don't feel like mixing or doing anything creative after that. So these steps allow me to have everything pre-plugged in, ready to go, and I can move much, much faster. So let's take a look at the last thing, are all of my effects. So we covered parallel compression and EQs in our side chains, which are kind of like effects. But what I have down here is I have effects that are either modulation, special effects, things like that of that nature. So these would be my reverbs, my delays, my flangers, uh, choruses. So, so my setup, what I have two, four pieces of outboard gear, sorry. I have two even tied H9 guitar pedals, which oddly enough to me, I was really enamored with the PCM 42s and I couldn't find anything that really copied them. So I spent a bunch of time in Sound Toys, Echo Boy, putting together a rack and copying it. It sounds great. But I found that I could dig in here a little bit and mess around, and I got some presets that sound exactly like them too. So I have two H9s. I have two even tight Eclipses digitally routed in and out of the system. And then I have a bunch of effects. So for instance, I have a small room and a medium room, always ready to go. So uh, this is like a, a, a wooden room. I use this mainly for vocals uh, when you want someone to sound like they weren't recorded in a studio. A Valhalla Vintage Verb is awesome. I have that set up for a chamber. That, that kind of does the old tile room thing of a PCM70, which I liked. Uh, then I have a bunch of things for vocals. I have, I have the Eventide Harmonizer uh, micro pitch shift program, which I had the outboard gear. It was great. Uh, this is a great, the ADT, you know, the old school doubling kind of sound. A slap effect. I had a Echoplex. I loved that I had a Space Echo and um, they just needed maintenance and it would sit behind me whirring around so I didn't want to listen to it. Uh, vocal plate. And then I have my vocal delays. And this is my effects rack and my PCM42 kind of sound alikes. So folks will ask me, well, why do you have delays for the vocals? And then why do you have delays for the instruments? So I would usually roll back, uh, send my delays into the appropriate reverb. So if I have a quarter note delay on the lead vocal, I would send on that back to the vocal plate. So that gives it a little more ambience, tucks it in the back. The other thing I do is after all my delays, I have a filter and I roll off high end and low end. So it stays in the background a little bit in the dark, not getting in the way. Then I have numerous other types of chorusing things, uh, delay throws for effects, you know, different reverbs. I, I have a couple of versions of this alto verb a few setups so if I want to blend the whole band together if it's supposed to sound more live or like it was recorded together the problem you know we run into today is that everybody's overdubbing everything and a lot of people are direct signals they're not miking anything so you can make it sound like it was recorded in a room uh, then I have this lead vocal echo throw um, I use the Chris Lord algae uh, effect one and I filter out some highs and then this is the um, the even tied time line I was telling you about for automating the flanger so what's cool is let's say oh you're like okay i'm working i want to go look at the drums you hit that that spot and you're like oh let me jump to the bass you can go there so you don't have to pan up and down through the whole session and keep scrolling and then if you want to see everything you just go back to show all tracks so there is my mix template so what we're going to do in the next video will be to take a song that's completely set ready to be mixed and we're going to import the template and we're going to move everything around 
and then we're going to get quick balances and just show you that part of it, how easy it could be. Thanks for watching. Have a great time mixing. If you have any questions or comments, hit me up. I'll be glad to answer them. If you need me to mix a tune or to help you, you need a lesson, I'll be glad to do that too. Thanks again. Please subscribe. Like the video if you dig it. Hit the notification bell so we can let you know when we have more content. Enjoy. Thanks.